Hello! In this video, I would like to describe methodologies and approaches that can be applied when using data science for proving the success of an educational innovation. We will talk about how to define the objective of the innovation, how to measure the success, how to conduct a small survey research for proving uh, the success of our innovation, how to compute uh, the sample design, how to write the questionnaire, and finally how to measure the sub subjective success of an innovation. When defining the objective of the innovation, we usually apply these innovations for improving the teaching and learning processes. But usually these innovations, they require human and economic resources, they take time and they need uh, the investment of uh, resources. So we eventually need uh, ev evidences of uh, how this effort was worthwhile and then it uh, actually improved uh, the learning and the academic performance achieved by students. When we think about how to measure the success of an innovation, we may think in traditional uh, measures such as the great performance average or maybe uh, the binary response, whether the student dropped uh, out uh, the course or not, or maybe if we are uh, collecting data about uh, online teaching, we may analyze the percentage of the course that was eventually completed. This collection of indicators, they are have been defined as objective, but also we may think in other type of subjective indicators, such as the teaching satisfaction, satisfaction with the professor of, or with the learning environment. We can think uh, of other uh, psychological measures, such as a decrease in anxiety during exams, or maybe motivation for studying, or we could analyze the development or acquisition of competences as a result, as a learning outcome of this uh, process. For collecting the data about uh, the innovation and how the innovation introduced a change in the process of uh, learning, first of all, we have to formulate the problem, we have to define which research question, which question are we interested in answering and then for writing the questionnaire, if we need a specific questionnaire and the questionnaire has not been previously created, neither validated by other authors, we will have interviews with experts and also we will have to review the state of the art and with this we will precise and we will write a hypothesis and specific questions that we want to answer through our research. With this, uh, we will compute the sample design for our population, for our group of students, and we will be ready to write the questionnaire. After having a preliminary version of the questionnaire, we will check whether questions are easily understood by all students through a pretest which is a review of the writing of the questions with a small number of students, uh, allowing them to uh, talk uh, freely about uh, how the questionnaire could be improved. And uh, with this information, we will write the final design of the questionnaire. On the other hand, we will have to compute how many responses do we need for achieving significant uh, responses or representative responses of our population. We will have to compute the expected number of responses of our sample. When we refer to sampling design, there are two types of design. We have the random design, sample design, and also the not random design. Across uh, all different types of uh, random sampling design, we may use the simple random sampling where each student has the same probability to be selected than any other or we could uh, consider the stratified sampling where we define stratum or groups of students where we want to guarantee that uh, these groups of students are properly represented in the, in the sampling. These uh, two types of uh, sample design 
are quite recommendable for uh, educational studies. We could uh, also select uh, randomly uh, like a number of students taken from a list of students, let's say one out of them. Each uh, 10 students I am selecting one of them. This would be a systematic sampling. Or if I cannot access randomly to all population of students, then I can use a not a random sampling in some uh, motivated and justified uh, situations. For instance, if I am using my uh, groups of students and I cannot uh, ask to other students because I don't have access to them, then I have to be aware that uh, this is a convenience sampling. My students are answering to my survey, so that's the sample that I, I have uh, access, that's a convenience. Or maybe we could be talking about a group of students that's uh, highly underrepresented in the population. So when I get access to one of them, when I, I, I am able to contact one of them, then I ask uh, him or her to, to provide me with uh, contacts of uh, their friends or their uh, peers in order to perform uh, the survey with uh, this small population of students. In those cases, uh, it could be justified to use a snowball sampling or a quota sampling. There are some formulas that are available for sample design, but mainly when we compute uh, the number of responses that we need for the sample design, we distinguish between large uh, populations with uh, thousands of people, let's say thousands of uh, students, or finite populations. The difference is the, that uh, the finite uh, population considers a large n, which is the population, the size of the group, where I intend to obtain the, the responses, and then there will be a lowercase n, the small n, which is going to be my computed and uh, estimated sample. There are formulas for both cases, and these formulas depend mainly on the sampling error that uh, has been represented here with the E, the, the E letter. And then these formulas depend also on the normalized uh, Z-score for the 95 level of confidence. That's a statistical parameter. We can change it, but uh, depending on the level of confidence that's expected for the result, then uh, the size of the sample we, will change accordingly and also there are some uh, parameters like the P and the Q which is the expectation of uh, each category of response as uh, described in the population. Usually we don't have information about how the people will uh, answer the questionnaire so we take uh, the worst place, the worst case which is considering P and also Q equal to 0 0.5. Uh, this is a common agreement and it's uh, usually applied uh, using these uh, numbers. So depending on uh, which approach are we considering, we will apply these formulas that can be easily uh, computed through any software like uh, Excel or any other calculator. When we uh, think of measuring the subjective success of our innovation, such as satisfaction with the process or with the environment, we have to use uh, measurement scales. And with these uh, measurement scales, there are a lot of them that are available uh, in the scientific community. We could uh, analyze the attitude towards studies, communication skills, anxiety during exams, motivation, satisfaction, competence achievement. There are lots of measurement scales that have been previously validated and are available for our studies. And uh, usually for these measurement scales, we will choose uh, Likert scales that are defined as summative because when I assign higher scores to this uh, scale, then it means that I have uh, a higher stand to the trait uh, of the trait that I am trying to measure. For instance, if my score is uh, higher in a satisfaction scale, that means that I am more satisfied. Also, these Likert scales are one-dimensional. That means that uh, they are only measuring one dimension, one trait, 
one psychological construct, let's say, satisfaction with the teaching process or motivation or anxiety. Each of these scales have been designed as one-dimensional and also these Likert scales have a limited and ordinal number of responses that in the majority of cases uh, ranges from 1 to 5 but it could measure from 1 to 7, from 0 to 10 and there, there is not uh, any common agreement about uh, which is the op optimum level of responses or how many responses should be available for, for respondents. Uh, the only agreement that we have to take into account that uh, five number uh, Likert scale it's the minimum number of uh, responses of uh, categories that we need uh, to consider that the variable behaves like a continuous variable. Here we have an example of a subjective measurement scale for measuring satisfaction. This scale was analyzed by Jacqueline and Douglas, uh, Alex Douglas. And here we can see the writing of different items concerning a satisfaction uh, measurement scale in a university from United Kingdom. Here would you see how we have uh, a scale ranging from 1 to 5 uh, and we have uh, two uh, concepts because uh, this format is containing two dimensions. So uh, we are analyzing satisfaction on one hand and then on the right side we are analyzing the importance given or assigned by, by the professor to any, uh, to the, by the student to each of these items. When working with the measurement scales we have to guarantee that the scales that we selected they are reliable. That means that the instrument accurately detects uh, differences between individuals. And also the instrument is valid. That means that the instrument is measuring what is intended to measure. So the definition, the writing of the items fits with the contents or the title or the name of the scale. We could consider different cases, in this case uh, where our instrument is not efficient in uh, measuring what we want to measure, uh, it could be satisfaction. Uh, this is a situation where the instrument is not uh, valid, neither uh, reliable. And maybe we could have a collection of items that are measuring something, but is something different from a satisfaction with the teacher. Maybe we are measuring something that's most related with uh, the classroom climate, maybe. Uh, we are measuring something and we are measuring it accurately, but uh, this is far from the definition that we had for the construct. And also we could have uh, this other case where our, our instrument allows us to measure uh, satisfaction with the uh, teaching process and we can do it uh, accurately. That means that our writings allow us to measure this uh, precisely and also the writing of the items are related with the contents of the scales and also the psychological idea that we want to measure. With this, I finish my presentation. Thank you for your attention. I hope to see you in next videos.